webinar series uh, uh, arranged by KCST in association with ABJ Abdul Kalam Technological University in connection with the National Technology Day 2021 celebrations. Uh, now I invite our Executive Vice President Dr. K.P. Sudhir uh, for uh, the welcome remarks. Sir. Yeah, thank you, Sharin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Well, uh, uh, this is in connection with the celebration of National Technology Day, which is uh, done every year on May 11th, basically to uh, commemorate with the, the Pokhran uh, uh, nuclear test, which was one of the kinds and, and the, which, the, the, which has taken the country into the six countries who had the nuclear power. And uh, it, it basically the, the government then announced that May 11th every year has to be celebrated as National Technology Day uh, uh, to promote science and technology activities and also to encourage the youth for taking up technological developments in their uh, career. I don't want to elaborate on that. So we have actually uh, Kerala State Council for Science, Technology and Environment generally uh, uh, organizes this every year. Last year we could not organize it because of the COVID pandemic, and this year uh, we are all. I, I guess that we are all staying home, and and uh, I, I wish all of you stay safe, and we have to resort it to the online program. We have planned it as a series of talks. Yesterday we had a, a inaugural talk by uh, Dr. Somnath from uh, uh, VSSE. Today we have uh, Sri Ignatius C A. is the vice president of. Uh, Winwish Technologies Trivandrum, which is a very good organization uh, in various activities. So I don't want to, and then we also have uh, three more talks scheduled uh, in, in uh, on Friday, uh, coming Monday and uh, Tuesday on the same time at four o'clock in the evening. So uh, I don't want to take much of a time. So I would request uh, uh, Sharin to introduce the speaker and uh, uh, continue with the talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sharin, uh, please introduce the speaker. Yeah. Sharin, are you there? Sharin, you got a connectivity problem? Let me check. Hello, sir. Ah, yeah, ah, so please introduce the speaker and then we can. Ah, sir, sir. Ah, yeah, sir, sir, sir. Ignatius, uh, Sri Ignatius, sir, is uh, an electronics engineer by profession and he's currently the vice president of the technical wing at the Winwish Technologies Private Limited, Techno Park Trivandrum. He was initially with the Indian Space Research Organization, ISRO, for almost 38 years and he had retired from the VSSC Center Trivandrum as an outstanding director and the deputy director of VSSC. He was also the chairman of National Institution for Quality and Reliability Trivandrum Branch, a national level organization for promoting quality and reliability. He has very long years of experience in senior engineering, management and leadership positions and has received many prestigious awards for his professional performance and contributions. Uh, sir, on behalf of KCST and KTU, I, I, I extend you a very warm welcome and uh, I hand over the session to you, uh, sir. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. 
Uh, first, let me thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to be a speaker and talk to the August audience in the webinar. Now, I will be talking about the exponential technologies in connection with the National Technology Day. During our lifetime, we have seen many new talk type of products have come to the market and all the type of products have disappeared from the market because of the technological advancement. Those technologies which make the performance double and the cost high in a very short period of time are called exponential technologies. The technology advances very fast. And by 2050, this world will be a technology-driven world. And it is going to be very much different from what it is today. Now, let me first introduce our uh, Binbish Technologies Private Limited for this August audience. Binbish Technologies Private Limited is a firm located at Technopark. We have two facilities. One is at Technopower, the other is at it is our RD center, and the other is at Kinfra, Kinfra Power, Manangulam. That is our production facility. We do electronics, mechanical, optical, firmware designs at our Technopark office, and our production facility is a full fledged electronic production facility with the two SMT reflow soldering lines for the electronics production, with the pick and place machines, wall grid IC rework stations, X-ray machines, etc. We also have an excellent mechanical enclosure bar chassis production facility with the CNC machine, CNC lathe, then and all the quality control equipment. This is our uh, production facility at uh, Technop at Kinfra. We have our um, uh, SMT production line. And this is our mechanical equipments, the CNC machines, X-ray machine, BGA rework station, etc. I have arranged my presentation. I have arranged my presentation uh, in such a way that I have prepared the PowerPoint slides. I have rendered voice to that PowerPoint slides and prepared it as a video. So I will be presenting small, small videos one after the other, which is actually my presentation. Now, I will show you a small video about our uh, Winbish Technologies Private Limited. Let me introduce Vinbish Technologies Private Limited. We are a leading, cutting edge technology development firm. Vinbish develops laser, electronics, and IoT products. Medical and industrial sectors. Vinbish is a concept to product development firm. We have about 150 engineers and technicians. Vinvish carries out electronics hardware design, embedded firmware development and testing, optics design, mechanical enclosure design and fabrication, PCB design, RF board testing and evaluation, checkout system design and development, volume production, manufacturing, testing, and quality assurance activities. Vinvish is a government approved R&D Center. Vinvish is also an Israel accredited design and production facility for avionics systems. Vinvish has received many awards for its excellent contributions. Vinvish product, the super continuum and confocal microscope was amongst the 11 top innovations selected by government of India under cross-sectional innovations in the year 2015. Confocal microscope is the first product under Make in India program of Government of India to receive an award. 
Vinvish received, Kerala State Government Award, of Unique Achievement, for Innovation, 2015. Other Achievements of Vinvish Department of, Science and Technology, Lockheed Martin, 2013 India Innovation Growth Program, Gold Medal Winner, for the Best Innovation in India, for PDT Laser Product. Department of Biotechnology, Ministry of Science and Technology, and Biotechnology Industry Research Assistance Council, Birak, Innovator of the Year 2013, Award Winner. Adyo Bharati Award 2013, Indian Achievers Forum, for the Excellent Performance in Biomedical Sector. So I will introduce our award-winning product, the Photodynamic Therapy Laser. Now, I will give you an introduction to our award-winning product, Photodynamic Therapy Laser Equipment. The PDT laser is used for cancer treatment, wound healing, skin care and R&D applications. It has a laser optical power of 1.2 watt. Please watch the following video. Photodynamic therapy is an option for destroying abnormal cells in the esophagus. Photodynamic means something that is activated by light. Two days before this treatment, light-sensitive medication is given. This medication is absorbed by all the cells in the body, but it builds up to a much greater degree in cancerous or precancerous cells. Once the medication has been absorbed, the physician uses an endoscope to guide a laser to the site of the abnormal cells. The light from the laser activates the medication in the light-sensitive abnormal cells to destroy them. Typically, healthy cells grow back in their place. This procedure may be repeated a number of times with several months in between. Vinvish Technologies Private Limited has developed a powerful therapeutic technique, photodynamic therapy, which is used for the destruction of cancer cells. The principle of photodynamic therapy is based on a photochemical reaction. By light activation of a photosensitizing drug at a particular wavelength, which causes tumor cell death. The excited photosynthesizing drug transfers energy to ground state of molecular oxygen. The excited state singlet oxygen thus formed is very reactive and has the ability to oxidize and damage bio-organic molecules such as proteins, nucleic acids and lipids. Thus, photodynamic therapy has an advantage over the therapeutic modalities of treatment. This system can also be used for other applications such as wound healing, antimicrobial PDT, skin cancer treatment, cosmetology, and in dentistry. The safety features include automatic shutdown on malfunction of the controller and a safety switch for emergency switch off. Our major uh, products are laser products. This is the this is an optical amplifier which are used in the uh, fiber optic communication link. These uh, optical amplifiers are used in the ground as well as underwater. Also, these optical fiber amplifiers are used. We we deliver for over the uh, ground as well as the under the ground optical amplifier, I mean underwater, underwater optical amplifiers. A small video on that. I will show where these Herbium are built fiber used amplifiers, also. Optical amplifiers, used along with optical fiber cables, are major products of Vinvish. Vinvish produces 200 milliwatt to 20 watt optical power laser erbium doped fiber amplifiers. These are used in over the ground systems as well as in underwater optical fiber cable systems. Have you ever thought about how you get emails or any other information from any corner of the world within a blink of an eye? This has been made possible by a network of cables, which are laid under the ground and below the ocean. 
The cables, which carry most of the world's data, are optical fiber cables. They are also used in medical equipment. Let's learn how optical fiber cables work and how they have revolutionized the world around us. Optical fiber cable is made up of thousands of fiber strands and a single fiber strand is as thin as a human hair. Optical fibers carry information in the form of light. Let's reflection is used in optical fiber cables to transmit the light. The simplest form of optical fiber cable is shown here, cylindrical glass with a high refractive index. If the laser strikes the interface at an angle greater than the critical angle, total internal reflection will happen and the light will reach the other end. This means that light can be confined in the optical fiber over a long distance, no matter what complex shape the fiber forms. Remember, total internal reflection happens between the high refractive index glass and the low refractive index air. However, optical fibers need a protective coating. A protective coating is not possible with this configuration. The introduction of protective material will replace the position of the air and cease the total internal reflection phenomenon. An easy way to overcome this issue is to introduce a low refractive index glass above the core glass, known as cladding. This way, total internal reflection will happen and we'll be able to use a protective layer. Both the core and the cladding use silica as their base material. The difference in the refractive index can be achieved by adding different types of dopants. The optical fiber we have just constructed won't be able to carry signals for more than 100 kilometers. This is due to various losses that happen in the cable. This loss of signal strength is generally called attenuation. Absorption and scattering are the main reasons for signal attenuation. This is why you see amplifiers and cables after a certain distance. They boost the signal strength and allow signals to be transmitted over a long distance. The power required for the amplifier is drawn from nearby sources. Now, back to the main topic. How does the optical fiber transmit information such as phone calls or internet signals? Any information can be represented in the form of zeros and ones. Assume you want to send a hello text message through your mobile. First, this word will be converted into an equivalent binary code as a sequence of zeros and ones. After the conversion, your mobile phone will transmit these zeros and ones in the form of electromagnetic waves. One is transmitted as a high frequency and zero as low frequency wave. Your local cell tower picks up these electromagnetic waves. At the tower, if the electromagnetic wave is of high frequency, a light pulse is generated. Otherwise, no pulse is generated. Now, these light pulses can easily be transmitted through optical fiber cables. The light pulses which carry the information have to travel through a complicated network of cables to reach their destination. For this purpose, the entire globe is covered with optical fiber cables. These cables are laid under the ground and below the ocean. It is mainly the mobile service providers that maintain these underground cables. AT&T, Orange, and Verizon are some of the few global players who own and maintain the submarine cable network. A detailed cross-section view of an undersea cable is shown here. You can see that only a small portion of the cable is used for holding the optical fiber. The remaining area of the cable is a mechanical structure for protection and strength. Now, the question is, where does the amplifier get power from under these deep oceans? Well, for this, a thin copper shell is used inside the cable, which carries electric power along the cable so that the amplifiers can be powered. This whole discussion simply means that if optical fiber cables do not reach a part of the globe, that part will be isolated from the internet or mobile communications. If we compare optical fiber cable to traditional copper cable, the optical fiber cable is superior in almost every way. Fiber optic cables provide larger bandwidth and transmit data at much higher speeds than copper cables. We also make fiber amplifiers for satellite-based applications. For providing internet services to remote areas and for high-speed internet, satellite-based communication systems are used. 
certain satellites are in geosynchronous orbit and some are in low Earth orbits. These optical amplifiers have to withstand space radiation, and Vinvish has developed and delivered radiation hardened, erbium doped fiber amplifiers for various agencies, including NASA, SpaceX, Facebook, etc. These optical amplifiers are used in satellite to satellite communication and satellite to ground communications. Like many of us, you may have laid witness to some bright strings of light shooting across the night sky recently. Shooting stars? Orchestrated drones? UFOs, perhaps? While any of those things would be equally as exciting, chances are what you were really seeing was Starlink, the satellite constellation being constructed by Elon Musk and his budding team at SpaceX. So what exactly is Starlink, and why is it projected to bring in around $30 billion of yearly revenue by the year 2025? Simply put, Starlink is a satellite internet constellation being constructed by SpaceX, Elon Musk's famously ambitious aerospace company. A satellite internet constellation, or mega constellation as it's also known, is a network of satellites that work together in unison to bring us internet access. The firm is working towards building a network of 12,000 satellites to provide high quality, affordable internet to essentially the entire planet. There are currently 420 Starlink satellites in orbit today, 300 of which were sent up between January and May of 2020 alone. As for the specs, we'll only know how Starlink's speed and latency figures stack up against the competition when real-world use is in full swing. Musk started Starlink as a SpaceX spin-off in order to fund his intergalactic exploration dreams of one day making it to Mars. Seeing as he was already in the business of sending stuff to space, capturing a significant portion of the estimated $1 trillion worldwide internet connectivity market seemed like a pretty good place to start. In 2015, Musk stated that he'd filed documents to place around 4,000 satellites into low Earth orbit. However, this number quickly turned into 12,000, and he may eventually be granted permission to send up as many as 30,000. To put that into perspective, according to the United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, only 9,000 artificial satellites have ever been launched into space, and just 2,000 remain to this day. So why does Musk need so many of these Starlink satellites, and how do they work in the first place? For starters, most of us tend to think of all satellites as being these great big pieces of engineering with two giant solar panels sticking out at either end. Starlink satellites are in fact relatively small. They weigh 500 pounds, are around the same size as a tabletop and feature just one solar panel. Krypton-powered iron thrusters allow the satellites to adjust their orbit while in use and deorbit when they reach the end of their working life. The satellites also have the ability to autonomously avoid space debris. SpaceX claims that their Starlink satellites are the first ever Krypton-propelled spacecraft, which is said to be the future of space propulsion. The Starlink system works by internet signals being communicated up to any Starlink satellite, being spread out throughout the network, and then being fired back down to any point on Earth. The process works in a somewhat similar way to traditional internet satellites, in which a signal is sent from the internet service provider to the satellite in orbit and is then triangulated back down to the receiver. However, in the Starlink system, the signal is sent from the internet service provider to one Starlink satellite, which then sends the signal to one of the four other satellites it's connected to. The signal is passed along the network at the speed of light until it reaches the optimum satellite for sending the signal down to the receiver. This process reduces latency or lag significantly over long distances. Each Starlink satellite is equipped with four incredibly powerful phased array antennas, with each being capable of handling an enormous amount of radio wave throughput. This facilitates a very efficient transfer of information and essentially very fast internet speeds. Delivering the internet via satellite is so much more efficient than by wire because the signal travels 47% faster as a wave through the vacuum of space than it does traveling along a fiber optic cable. Fiber optic internet will remain faster over short distances, but over longer ranges there will be no comparison. Starlink will also be able to provide such reliable and fast internet because of where they are being placed in orbit. Current internet satellites orbit at around 35,800 kilometers above the Earth, which is really far away, so the coverage area for each satellite is great, but the distance also results in a time delay between sending and receiving data. Starlink satellites orbit significantly closer at around 550 kilometers above the Earth's surface. This means that they triangulate data much faster with minimal delay, but also means that their coverage area is far smaller, so we need a load more of them to build up a comprehensive network that offers reliable global coverage. Starlink is set to start offering services in the northern US and Canada by late 2020 and expects to offer near-global coverage of the populated world by the year 2021. These dates are just around the corner, making Starlink's estimated yearly revenue of $30 billion by 2025 seem even more mind-boggling. 
However, if you take into consideration that internet access is said to be a $1 trillion industry, Starlink has only to capture 3% of that market to hit those figures. As it stands, SpaceX's annual revenue is just a fraction of that number at $2 billion, and Musk says that number could only really stretch to $3 billion if they continue down the same path. The huge influx in revenue Starlink might, and most probably will, break in will open up a whole new world of possibilities to SpaceX, not to mention speed up their ever-increasing rate of development within the aerospace technology sector. Musk's plans to get people to Mars by 2050 might be a possibility after all. We also make lasers for LiDAR systems. Another major, cutting-edge technology product of Vinvish is MOPA lasers. MOPA stands for Master Oscillator Power Amplifier. MOPA produces very narrow laser pulses of the order of 1 to 5 nanoseconds with optical power ranging from milliwatts to about 2 watts. These MOPA amplifiers are used in LiDAR systems for obstacle detection. Vinvish produces many different types of MOPA amplifiers for various uses. Please watch the following video from YouTube on LiDAR systems. LiDAR, light detection and ranging. Though LiDAR is used in a number of applications, we have chosen the top five areas where LiDAR plays an important role. Autonomous vehicles. If you've seen a self-driving car before, you've probably seen a LiDAR sensor. LiDAR works as an eye of autonomous vehicles. Imagine if your human eyes allowed you to see in all directions all of the time. Imagine if, instead of guessing, you could always know the precise distance of objects in relation to you. LiDAR enables a self-driving car to view the surroundings with a few special superpowers. Agriculture LiDAR can be used to create 3D elevation maps of a particular land, which can be converted to create slope and sunlight exposure area map. This information can be used to identify the areas which require more water or fertilizer and will help farmers to save on their cost of labor, time and money. River Survey Water penetration green light of the LiDAR is used to measure underwater and helps create 3D model of the terrain. Underwater information of a river can help understand the depth, width and flow of the water. It helps in monitoring the flood plains. Modeling of the pollution. LiDAR wavelengths are shorter, which operate in ultraviolet, visible region or near infrared. This helps to image the particulate matter which are in the same size or larger than the wavelength. So LiDAR can detect pollutant particles of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide and methane. This information helps researchers to create pollutant density map of the area, which can be used for better planning of the city. For archaeology and building construction, LiDAR plays an important part for the archaeologist to understand the surface. LiDAR can detect microtopography that is hidden by vegetation, which helps archaeologists to understand the surface. Ground-based LiDAR technology can be used to capture the building's structure. This digital information can be used for 3D mapping on the ground, which can be used to create models of the structure. It is very useful for maintaining a record of the structure. Actually, uh, what you have seen so far are all examples of exponential technologies. Now you can watch one more video. Now, coming back to our topic, exponential technologies. This is the typewriter, which was there in every office during the 90s. Even there was a job post called as typist. But now, with the advent of PC and printer, the typewriter has disappeared. 
This is an example of disruptive or exponential technologies. In the case of harvesting, humans, mostly women, were standing in muddy water and harvesting using sickles. But now, harvesting machines are doing the job. Again, advancing technologies. The bullocks and bullet carts have been replaced by tractors. The horse carts have been replaced by automobiles, cars, buses, trains and aeroplanes. The music system has seen a tremendous change. Our LP gramophone systems had changed too, Walkman, the audio tape recorder. Walkman and other audio tape recorder systems were there for quite a long time. Then came the iPod and digital audio recorders. Now, the mobile phones have replaced all the other music systems. Gramophone LP recorders, audio tape recorders, iPod and similar digital recorders all have become things of past, obsolete. Now you cannot buy these from normal shops. These are examples of exponential technologies. Now, look at the camera and photography technologies. We had black and white films, then color films, then Polaroid films, which gave instant photos. Even Kodak, a leading manufacturer of Polaroid films, did not see the writing in the wall, the future. When digital photography came, they were nowhere in the picture of camera and film marketing. Look at the dramatic change of technology in telephones. Now, mobile, smartphone, has made all the other type of phones, obsolete. Have you seen these, or remember these? There were STD booths, everywhere, every corner of a building in a city. But now, mobile phones, have made all of the above, not relevant now. Exponential technologies are those technologies that allow change at an accelerated speed. It is two things. First, it is exponential. In each period, it doubles in capability or performance, or halves in cost in each period. It is a technology that makes it possible to solve today's problems in ways that were not previously possible. Digitalization, in which Moore's Law says, overall processing power for computers doubles every two years. Deception, which means some other technologies will disappear. Example is LED lamps replaced incandescent bulbs.
Disruption. Which means these technologies disrupt established industries. Mobile phones replace telegraph system. Demonetization. When a technology removes the need for consumers to buy something. An example is how digital photography removes the need to buy films. Dematerialization. When physical tools are replaced by digital apps. Examples are a GPS locator, a radio and record player, a camera and video recorder, all consolidated into a smartphone. Democratization. As costs decrease, access becomes available to everyone. Examples are the cost of 3D printing has dropped by a factor of 400 in the past seven years. Examples of exponential technologies. Explosion in connectivity, cognitive and quantum computing, voice recognition, robotics, additive manufacturing, 3D printing, virtual reality. Internet of Things, IoT, Autonomous Vehicles, Computer Telepathy, suggests that it will be possible to capture a thought and share it with the world. Brain Computer Interface, Cloud Computing, Virtual Assistants, even Google Assistant is an AI software. Now look at the progress that have made in the sector of railway and trains. Commercial train service in the world was first started in the year 1802. Steam engines using coal and water were used in them. The power and speed were much low at that time. Then came the diesel engines with improved power and speed. The journey was also more comfortable and comparatively clean. Electric trains have much better power and higher speeds. Kerala and India have not progressed beyond electric trains. Government of India is planning to have bullet trains in India in near future. In many Western countries, China and Japan, bullet trains are common. They achieve speeds of 180 to 200 km per hour. Now, they are developing bullet trains which run without wheels. The principle is magnetic levitation. The entire train will be floating by electromagnetic force and forward motion is again achieved by magnetic force. These trains can achieve speed dot of about 600 km per hour. Please see the following veto from YouTube. The Chuo Shinkansen Mega Project Japan is one of the world's most developed countries, known for its innovation. Today, the most efficient way to move around Japan is by train. Their train system is simply one of the best in the world. Alongside a great safety record, they are always punctual, as well as comfortable to ride in. To have such a network is impressive, considering most of the country is covered by mountain ranges. Japan is also a pioneer when it comes to high-speed trains. As it recovered from the devastation of the Second World War, it came up with its first high-speed train network in 1964. The first line was built to connect two of Japan's most important cities, Tokyo and Osaka. Shinkansen is the word used to describe bullet trains in Japan, and it literally means new trunk line. The design of the bullet train, with its needle-nosed aerodynamic shape, is iconic and one of the most recognizable pieces of Japanese engineering. When they launched, the trains could reach a speed of 210 kilometers per hour. 
Over the years, the bullet trains have been getting faster and the travel times have been getting shorter. A 350 kilometer trip from Tokyo to Nagoya using a bullet train currently just takes an hour and 20 minutes. However, that's not fast enough for a country where time is everything. That's why Japan wanted to cut the time by 50%. Their solution was to build the Shuo Shinkansen Mega Project, a new train that will use cutting edge maglev technology. What exactly is a maglev train? Maglev is short for magnetic levitation. A maglev train works by using two sets of magnets, one set to repel and push the train up off the track, and the other set to move the elevated train ahead. This means that the train can take advantage of the lack of friction to achieve a normal operation speed of over 500 kilometers per hour. You could say it's a floating train and an amazing feat of engineering. It currently holds the world record of 603 kilometers per hour with the experimental Maglev train LO series. It has a much higher acceleration and deceleration performance compared to conventional high-speed rail, making it stand out from the competition. The construction of the Chuo Shinkansen began in 2014 and is estimated to cost almost $90 billion. The commercial service between Tokyo and Nagoya is due to begin in 2027, and the trip, which currently takes over an hour and 20 minutes, will only take 40 minutes. There are also plans to extend the line Nagoya to Osaka by 2045. The Internet of Things IoT, refers to the ever-growing network of physical objects that are connected to Internet and the communication that occurs between them. In simple words, Internet of Things IoT, is an ecosystem of connected physical objects that are accessible through the Internet. It is also referred to as machine to machine M to M Skynet, or Internet of Everything. A technological revolution is taking place in the area of Internet of Things. Normally, Internet is used for connecting people to people and people to machine or people to things. When machines are connected to machines or things to things, it is called Internet of Things. When devices can represent themselves digitally, they can be controlled from anywhere. The connectivity then helps us capture more data from more places, ensuring more ways of increasing efficiency. Projections for the impact of IoT on the Internet and economy are impressive, with some anticipating as many as 100 billion connected IoT devices and a global economic impact of more than $11 trillion by 2025. The potential economic impact of IoT is huge. Imagine you're at work and realize that you might not have turned off the air conditioner while leaving your house. Instead of traveling all the way back home, what if you could use your smartphone to know the status of your AC and perhaps even turn it off? Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, yes. And this can be achieved with the help of the Internet of Things. Until recently, access to the Internet was limited via devices like the desktop, tablet, or smartphone. But now, with IoT, practically all appliances can be connected to the Internet and monitored remotely. IoT is shaping the way we live our lives. It helps us get a better insight into the working of things around us. So what exactly is the Internet of Things? IoT is a system of interrelated devices connected to the Internet to transfer and receive data from one to the other. A smart home is the best example of IoT. 
Home appliances like the AC, doorbell, thermostats, smoke detectors, water heaters, and security alarms can be interconnected to share data with the user over a mobile application. The user can now get detailed insight into the working of the devices around him. Think about it. Until recently, the internet helped people connect and interact with each other. But now, inanimate objects or things have the ability to sense the surroundings to interact and collaborate with one another. For example, in the morning when your alarm goes off, the IoT system can open the window blinds, turn on the coffee pot for you, and even turn on the water heater. Although all of this is fascinating, there's a lot that goes on in the background to ensure seamless functioning. From effective communication between devices to accurate processing of the data received, a lot of components are involved. In the context of IoT devices, hardware can be classified into general devices and sensing devices. The general devices are the main components of the data hub and information exchange. They are connected either by wired or wireless interfaces. Home appliances are a classic example of such devices. The sensing devices, on the other hand, include sensors and actuators. They measure the temperature, humidity, light intensity, and other parameters. These IoT devices are connected to the network with the help of gateways. These gateways, or processing nodes, process the information collected from the sensors and transfer it to the cloud. The cloud acts as both the storage and processing unit. Actions are performed on the collected data for further learning and inferences. Wired and wireless interfaces like Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, GSMs, and so on are used to provide connectivity. To ensure its ubiquity, applications need to support a diverse set of devices and communication protocols, from tiny sensors capable of sensing and reporting the desired factor to powerful back-end servers that are utilized for data analysis and knowledge extraction. To help you understand its working, Let's take a simple scenario. Let's suppose you want to water your garden every time the moisture level in the soil drops. Instead of doing it manually, you could automate it using IoT. The sensors and actuators installed gauge the soil for its moisture. This information is sent to the IoT gateway with the help of communication protocols like MQTT or HTTP. The gateway significantly aggregates data and feeds it to the cloud with the help of Wi-Fi, LAN. Once the moisture level drops, the system is immediately triggered and the sprinklers are turned on. However, with the information stored in the cloud, a detailed analysis like the time of the day the sprinkler was turned on, the rate at which the moisture in the soil reduces, and so on, can be done, and the report can be sent over to you on your smartphone over and over. With the improved response, monitoring, and analytical capabilities, IoT has been adopted in almost all industries and domains, opening doors to insects. Today, IoT is being used extensively to lessen the burden on humans. Today, with you, IoT is deployed for smart homes, wearables, watches and braces, Wearables, smart coaches and races, smart farming, smart, cars, smart retail, farm, smart grid, retail, smart city, smart grid, and smart health. City. And with smart such a health. wide spectrum of applications, wide the spectrum future of IT looks more, future looks more promising than ever before. In 2018, there were about 23 billion connected devices, was more than double the world population. According to experts, there will be over 80 billion devices by 2025. IoT is a vision to connect all devices with the power of the internet. Always learning and always growing. The integration of IoT with other technologies like cloud computing, machine learning, and artificial intelligence is paving the way for many new and exciting innovations. And that is the Internet of Things for you in short. robotics and artificial intelligence that is also an exponential technology example of exponential technology robotics and artificial intelligence have seen enormous growth in the last decade the future is very bright for this sector Robots are the artificial intelligence agents acting in a real-world environment. Robots are aimed at manipulating objects, thereby freeing manpower from doing repetitive functions. Without getting bored, distracted, 
or exhausted. Robotics is a branch of artificial intelligence, which is composed of electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, and computer science. Robots are needed because they can work very fast, can work in hazardous environments, and do repetitive tasks, and can work with high accuracy. The robotics has been instrumental in various industries. Robots are used for handling material, cutting, welding, color coding, drilling, polishing, etc. Military autonomous robots can reach inaccessible and hazardous zones during yeah. war. A robot named Dash, developed by Defense Research and Development Organization DRDO no, is in function to destroy life-threatening objects safely. Robots are capable of carrying out hundreds of clinical tests simultaneously, rehabilitating permanently disabled people and performing complex surgeries such as brain tumors. Robots are an important component in intelligent environments to automate devices, to provide physical services, etc. Robot systems in these environments need particular capabilities like autonomous control systems, simple and natural human robot interface, adaptive and learning capabilities. Robots have to maintain safety during operations. Please watch the following YouTube video to see the advances in robotics. Taking people's jobs, robots have been proven to be essential in improving efficiency, productivity, and most importantly, worker safety. In this video, we are going to look at the most advanced humanoid, industrial, and service robots that are changing the future with the help of artificial intelligence. Meet Digit. Manufactured by Agility Robotics, Digit is envisioned to help take care of people in their homes, assist with disaster response, and deliver packages to front doors. With its nimble limbs and a torso packed with sensors, Digit can navigate complex environments and carry out tasks such as package delivery. Digit is a direct descendant of Cassie, Agility's first robot. In May 2019, Ford Motor Company and Agility announced a partnership to develop a last-mile logistics solution that combines Ford's autonomous vehicle technology and Agility's Digit. This is Pepper. Manufactured by SoftBank Robotics, Pepper is the world's first social humanoid robot that is able to recognize faces and basic human emotions. Pepper has been adopted by over 2,000 companies around the world. Perfect in retail and finance industries, Pepper has numerous functionalities, including increasing store traffic by attracting the attention of shoppers, creating memorable in-store experiences, stimulating purchase and retain customers. Pepper can also gather comprehensive data to enrich the customer base and generate shopper insights.
This is Atlas, the world's most dynamic humanoid robot built by Boston Dynamics, a company that was previously owned by Google and now by SoftBank. Thanks to its state-of-the-art hardware and algorithm that allows it to quickly understand instructions. With its 28 hydraulic joints, 4.9 feet of height, and 176 pounds weight, the robot can perform both impressive and terrifying acts, including navigating uneven terrain, jumping around a parkour course, and doing somersaults. All these activities demonstrate human-level agility, so the robot can be perfect for search and rescue operations and performing human tasks in environments where humans could not survive. Introducing Spot, a robot dog designed for industrial uses, such as carrying goods through a warehouse and inspecting a remote site with an unfavorable environment for human operators tasks. Well, it seems advancement on this technology has come on leaps and bounds, especially when it comes to animal robots that have been designed to help those with disabilities. Make sure you stick to the very end as the final feat of technology will blow your mind. The Festo company has released a long line of animal-inspired machines over the years from a mechanical kangaroo that uses its own generated power to hop indefinitely, to beautiful robotic butterflies. Its latest creation isn't a land animal, but is, in fact, a gripper based on the tentacles of an octopus that can be attached to the end of a robotic arm. It is made of soft silicone and features two rows of suction cups running throughout it. By applying compressed air, the tentacle can wrap around a wide variety of different shaped objects without any problems, just like a real-life octopus. It also uses a vacuum to increase suction for heavier items. Because of its softness, it holds promise for robots that are required to work more closely with humans. Just like an octopus's tentacles need hundreds of suckers, engineering students have built an unbelievable robot horse that wouldn't look out of place in a futuristic war film. The Scalf is a four-legged robot that can maneuver through an array of difficult terrains, track people on sight, and keep its balance when attacked with a forceful blow, all while carrying 120 kilograms of people or gear. It was developed by a team of students from Shandong University in China. The incredible AI is being hailed as one of the most and compared to Boston Dynamics dog robot Spot that we told you about at the beginning of this video. The team hoped to further the Scalf's combat features so that it can ambush and attack, as well as have surveillance, reconnaissance, and decoy modes. Look at the advances that has taken place in aircraft technology. Orville and Wilbur, Wright brothers, made history by successfully flying the first powered aircraft on December 17, 1903. Today air travel is considered as the most safe travel mode. No war can be won without Air Force. Tremendous development has taken place in aircraft technology after the first flight of Wright Brothers. Please see the following video from YouTube.
A century ago on the sands of Kitty Hawk, two brothers, Wilbur and Orville Wright, bicycle mechanics and inventors, built flying machines which would transform our world. Aerospace Line Super Guppy. The Aerospace Line Super Guppy is a large, wide-bodied cargo aircraft used for hauling outsized cargo components. It was the successor to the Pregnant Guppy, the first of the Guppy aircraft produced by Aerospace Lines. Five were built in two variants, both of which were colloquially referred to as the Super Guppy. The length of the aircraft is 143 feet, and its wingspan is 156 feet. Its payload is slightly over 54,500 pounds. Boeing C-17 Globemaster III The Boeing C-17 Globemaster III is a large military transport aircraft. It was developed for the United States Air Force from the 1980s to the early 1990s by McDonnell Douglas. The C-17 commonly performs tactical and strategic airlift missions, transporting troops and cargo throughout the world. Its additional roles include medical evacuation and airdrop duties. The payload of the C-17 is more than 170,000 pounds, 77.5 tons, and its length and wingspan are 174 and 170 feet respectively. Airbus A300-600ST Beluga The Airbus A300-600ST Super Transporter, or Beluga, is a version of the standard A300-600 wide-body airliner modified to carry aircraft parts and oversized cargo. While it initially received the official name of Super Transporter, the name Beluga gained popularity due to its resemblance to the whale and has since been officially adopted. The maximum payload of the aircraft is 103,600 pounds, 47 tons. The length and wingspan are 184 and 147 feet, respectively. Boeing 747 Dreamlifter The Boeing 747 Dreamlifter, also known as the Boeing 747-400 Large Cargo Freighter, is a wide-body cargo aircraft. Cargo is placed in the aircraft by the world's longest cargo loader. It is an extensively modified Boeing 747-400 that is used exclusively for transporting Boeing 7870 Dreamliner aircraft components to Boeing's assembly plants from suppliers around the world. The maximum payload capacity is 250,000 pounds, 113,400 kilograms. The length of the aircraft is 235 feet, and its wingspan is 211 feet. Lockheed C-5 Galaxy, Antonov AN-225 Murya. The Antonov AN-225 Murya is a strategic airlift cargo aircraft that was designed by the Antonov Design Bureau in the Ukrainian SSR within the Soviet Union during the 1980s. It is powered by six turbofan engines and is the heaviest aircraft ever built, with a maximum payload capacity of 551,155 pounds, 250 tons. It also has the largest wingspan of any aircraft in operational service. Unlike the Ruslan, Murya has only one cargo hatch, which is located in the nose of the aircraft. Like its predecessor, Murya can change the ground clearance and the angle of the fuselage, which is extremely convenient during loading and unloading. That's all friends, thanks for watching. You have seen how the aircraft technology has changed from Wright Brothers' tiny aircraft to today's gigantic aircrafts. Technological advancements will continue. Already, research and development 
is going on on electric aircrafts and much more powerful aircrafts. Such technologies are termed exponential technologies. The developments that have taken place in the last 50 years are much more than that have happened in the last 500 years. Thank you. Now I will just touch upon the 5G mobile technology also. Five G mobile is the next big revolution in mobile communication. The mobile technology has undergone a sea of changes from the first generation one G to today's four G. With the five G, you will get much cheaper, ten times faster data communication with a lot of added features. Five G stands for fifth generation. Wireless technology. It is going to become the next major phase of mobile telecommunication beyond the current 4G standard. It will change the way we are using wireless gadget by providing very high bandwidth. It adds a number of advantages over the present 4G technology. High speed, high capacity. 5G technology, providing large broadcasting of data in gigabits per second data rate. Multimedia newspapers and watch TV programs with the clarity as to that of an HD quality. Faster data transmission and that of the previous generations. Large phone memory dialing speed, clarity in audio and video. Supports interactive multimedia voice streaming video, internet and other data transfers. 5G is more effective and more attractive. Please watch the following video to get more insights. Every new generation of wireless networks delivers faster speeds and more functionality to our smartphones. 1G brought us the very first cell phones. 2G let us text for the first time. 3G brought us online, and 4G delivered the speeds that we enjoy today. But as more users come online, 4G networks have just about reached the limit of what they're capable of at a time when users want even more data for their smartphones and devices. Now we're headed toward 5G, the next generation of wireless. It will be able to handle a thousand times more traffic than today's networks, and it'll be up to 10 times faster than 4G LTE. Just imagine downloading an HD movie in under a second, and then let your imagination run wild. 5G will be the foundation for virtual reality, autonomous driving, the Internet of Things, and stuff we can't even yet imagine. But what exactly is a 5G network? The truth is, experts can't tell us what 5G actually is, because they don't even know yet. But right now, there are five brand new technologies emerging as the foundation of 5G. Millimeter waves, small cells, massive MIMO, beamforming, and full duplex. First up, technology number one, millimeter waves. Your smartphone and other electronic devices in your home use very specific frequencies on the radio frequency spectrum, typically those under six gigahertz. But these frequencies are starting to get more crowded. Carriers can only squeeze so many bits of data on the same amount of radio frequency spectrum. As more devices come online, we're going to start to see slower service and more dropped connections. The solution is to open up some new real estate. So researchers are experimenting with broadcasting on shorter millimeter waves, those that fall between 30 and 300 gigahertz. This section of spectrum has never been used before for mobile devices and opening it up means more bandwidth for everyone. But there is a catch. Millimeter waves can't travel well through buildings or other obstacles, and they tend to be absorbed by plants and rain. To get around this problem, we'll need technology number two, small cell networks. Today's wireless networks rely on large, high-powered cell towers to broadcast their signals over long distances. But remember, higher-frequency millimeter waves have a harder time traveling through obstacles, which means if you move behind one, you lose your signal. 
Small cell networks would solve that problem using thousands of low power mini base stations. These base stations would be much closer together than traditional towers, forming a sort of relay team to transmit signals around obstacles. This would be especially useful in cities. As the user moved behind an obstacle, his smartphone would automatically switch to a new base station in better range of his device, allowing him to keep his connection. Next up, technology number three, Massive MIMO. MIMO stands for Multiple Input, Multiple Output. Today's 4G base stations have about a dozen ports for antennas that handle all cellular traffic. But Massive MIMO base stations can support about 100 ports. This could increase the capacity of today's networks by a factor of 22 or more. Of course, Massive MIMO comes with its own complications. Today's cellular antennas broadcast information in every direction at once, and all of those crossing signals could cause serious interference. Which brings us to technology number four, beamforming. Beamforming is like a traffic signaling system for cellular signals. Instead of broadcasting in every direction, it would allow a base station to send a focused stream of data to a specific user. This precision prevents interference and it's way more efficient. That means stations could handle more incoming and outgoing data streams at once. Here's how it works. Say you're in a cluster of buildings and you're trying to make a phone call. Your signal is ricocheting off of surrounding buildings and crisscrossing with other signals from users in the area. A massive MIMO base station receives all of these signals and keeps track of the timing and the direction of their arrival. It then uses signal processing algorithms to triangulate exactly where each signal is coming from and plots the best transmission route back through the air to each phone. Sometimes it'll even bounce individual packets of data in different directions off of buildings or other objects to keep signals from interfering with each other. The result is a coherent data stream sent only to you. Which brings us to technology number five, full duplex. If you've ever used a walkie-talkie, you know that in order to communicate, you have to take turns talking and listening. That's kind of a drag. Today's cellular base stations have that exact same holdup. A basic antenna can only do one job at a time, either transmit or receive. This is because of a principle called reciprocity, which is the tendency for radio waves to travel both forward and backward along the same frequency. To understand this, it helps to think of a wave like a train loaded up with data. The frequency it's traveling on is like the train track. And if there's a second train trying to go in the opposite direction on the same track, you're going to get some interference. Up until now, the solution has been to have the trains take turns or to put all the trains on different tracks or frequencies. But you can make things a lot more efficient by working around reciprocity. Researchers have used silicon transistors to create high-speed switches that halt the backward roll of these waves. It's kind of like a signaling system that can momentarily reroute two trains so that they can get past each other. That means there's a lot more getting done on each track a whole lot faster. We're still working out many of the kinks with millimeter waves, small cell networks, massive MIMO, beamforming, and full duplex. In fact, all of 5G is still a work in progress. It will likely include other new technologies, too. And I think I have uh, come to the conclusion of the presentation. So the uh, technological advancements that has taken place in the last maybe 100 or 50 years, the the Technology actually has taken over all the development activities in the world. And I have one more small no, video. If the time permits, maybe a 10 minutes, I can present how the world will be in 2050. Shereen, can I uh, present or can I conclude right now? I think Sharon is not there. Sir, okay, uh, sir then, I think uh, the participants uh, uh, are very interested with your talk. That's what uh, the chat box is. So maybe you can continue, sir. I have one more video that shows how the world will be in 2015. 2050. 2050. It's a, it will that take about interesting, eight sir, to please. 10 minutes. Sir, sir, please. By 2050. Our planet will be a vastly different place. By 2050, artificial intelligence will be everywhere. 
AI-driven stores will allow you to purchase goods without cashiers or waiting lines. AI will diagnose and treat patients, manage transportation, and analyze massive quantities of data. AI chatbots and voice recognition systems will sound like and behave just like real people. AI will be implemented into robots. By 2050, robot dogs and other pets will serve as companions. Robots will dominate factories and begin to serve as teachers, cooks, pharmacists, law enforcement officers, athletes, and other professionals. In 2050, universal translators will remove all language barriers and voice recognition will be ubiquitous. Hundreds of sensors will be installed in our clothes, homes, and overall environment to monitor our well-being and improve our lives. Computing will change. By 2050, we may run on quantum computers. Based on the properties of quantum physics, quantum computers could deliver massive leaps in computing power, outstripping any current transistor-based models. AI and computers will integrate into humans. Brain chips like Elon Musk's Neuralink will treat neurological disorders like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, spinal cord injury, and blindness. These brain chips will allow people to control computers and prosthetics with no physical interaction. By 2050, we may be controlling things with our minds and communicating through brain signals. By 2050, robotic prosthetics may be stronger and more advanced than our own biological ones. Prosthetic eyes and ears will enter the market, curing blindness and deafness. And in 30 years, like AI, virtual reality will be everywhere. People will try on clothes in virtual reality closets, and holograms will bring FaceTime to a new level. VR platforms will allow you to move around while staying still. We will be able to travel the world and experience life on other planets, all from home. In 2014, 320,000 new electric vehicles were registered around the world. In 2019, that number was 2.3 million. By 2025, global EV sales are projected to surpass 10 million. And by 2050, the majority of automobiles will be electric. Gas stations will disappear and be replaced with at-home charging stations, refueling vehicles in as low as 10 minutes. Automobiles will become driverless. As of now, Tesla vehicles already have autopilot features that achieve level two automation on the Society of Automotive Engineers vehicle automation ranking. Other companies such as Google have invested billions of dollars into self-driving technology. Currently, it's expected that fully autonomous level five vehicles will roll out to consumers in the late to mid 2020s and become commonplace in the 2030s. By 2050, people will be hopping into cars with no steering wheel. Thousands of autonomous vans and semi-trucks will travel across country, delivering packages and shipments with no human interaction. Drones will do the same for shorter distances. By 2050, swarms of drones will be delivering small packages from floating or vertical warehouses. There will also be surveillance and security drones, along with drones for construction, entertainment, and agriculture. eVTOLs, or electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, will provide urban transportation. Currently, there are several working eVTOL aircraft prototypes. The urban market for them is massive, and studies have revealed that the technology could become highly profitable. One of the companies working on eVTOLs is Uber, who wants to make aerial ride-sharing a reality. There's also Airbus, who have their drone-like Airbus pop-up concept. If Uber, Airbus, and other companies succeed, we could see widespread adoption of the technology. By 2050, cities will likely have air taxis everywhere. But that may not work. Elon Musk says that roads must go 3D, which means either flying cars or tunnels. He believes the answer is tunnels. Right now, Elon Musk's boring company is digging small experimental tunnels under cities. If Musk can significantly cut down boring costs, by 2050, cities will have thousands of tunnels underneath them. Another one of Musk's brainchilds, Hyperloop, will revolutionize long-distance land transportation. Hyperloop, the idea for vacuum maglev high-speed trains, could speed up to 700 miles per hour. A trip from Los Angeles to San Francisco would be only 43 minutes long, compared to a six-hour car ride. By 2050, Hyperloop systems will certainly be constructed, and replacing airplanes may evolve into the most popular type of long-distance domestic travel. 
but for travel between continents, airplanes will remain dominant. With improved batteries, we could see electric airliners take to the skies. In addition, several companies are working to bring back supersonic aircraft. These aircraft are certainly not airliners, but small-scale jets meant to carry only 10 to 100 people. By 2050, we could have Concorde-like, but safer, supersonic aircraft soaring through the skies. Or as an alternative to airplanes, what if we traveled around in rockets? Well, Elon Musk wants to use his Starship to transport people all around the world soon. In Musk's Starship, one could travel from New York to London in only 29 minutes. Our energy system is transforming. Over the past decade, the cost of solar power has plummeted. Due to economies of scale and improved technology, the price of solar equipment has dropped by 89% since 2010. The cost for wind power has plunged as well. Due to these decreases, new solar and wind investments are usually cheaper than natural gas and coal investments. However, renewables still have one major setback, energy storage. For utility-scale systems, renewables need a way to store excess energy from windy and sunny days for cloudy and calm days. To help with this, researchers are developing new methods to store large amounts of energy. Some examples include storing energy as heat in materials, compressing air, or turning air into a liquid. Although it remains to be seen which method is best, these solutions will certainly be implemented for large-scale utility in the future. By 2050, renewables are expected to provide nearly half of all world electricity. But that's not all. As solar and wind begin to dominate the energy sector, fusion power will rise. Currently, fusion power is purely speculative. However, 35 nations are collaborating on ITER, a $20 billion project in France to test the feasibility of fusion for power generation. ITER will work by creating a fusion-powered plasma inside an experimental machine. The walls of the machine will absorb the energy, using it to produce steam that will generate electricity with turbines. ITER's first plasma is planned for December 2025. By 2050, we could have fully functional fusion power plants, operating more efficiently than any other power source in history. With NASA's Artemis program, it's planning to land humans back on the moon by 2024. SpaceX, Dynetics, and Blue Origin are all working on landers for the project. After the moon, NASA wants to send humans to Mars sometime in the 2030s. SpaceX is even more ambitious. They are developing the Starship, a rocket that they hope will send humans to Mars by 2024. Once they get there, SpaceX plans to establish a permanent colony. By 2050, Elon Musk plans to have a Martian city with as many as 1 million people. SpaceX is also developing Starlink, thousands of satellites that will provide the world's most advanced broadband internet system. Other space companies such as Blue Origin, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, and Virgin Galactic are all racing for space as well. In 30 years, we might have a permanent colony on the moon, space hotels in orbit, and humans on Mars. By 2050, our food consumption will be wildly different, mostly due to meat. Livestock contributes to 15% of human greenhouse gas emissions and uses 26% of the Earth's terrestrial surface. To feed our growing population while lowering emissions, we must move away from meat. Assisting with this are meat alternatives. Companies like Beyond Meat and Impossible Foods have obtained billion-dollar valuations supplying the rapidly growing meat alternatives market. In addition, plant-based diets as a whole are growing in popularity. Then there's cultured meat. Cultured meat is meat produced by in vitro cell culture. It avoids the slaughtering of animals and produces very minimal emissions. By 2050, we will likely have in vitro T-bone steaks produced for the masses. To meet the demand for increased plants and the growing population while escaping the uncertainty of the changing climate, farms will move indoors, vertical, and into cities. The vertical farming market is exploding. By 2050, there will be large-scale vertical farms all around the world, feeding the growing population while using very little land and water. 
As our food consumption transforms, biotechnology will advance. While prosthetics replace large organs, stem cells will regenerate injuries and diseases. Stem cells, which can be guided into becoming a wide variety of specific cells, will be used for therapies. Eventually, like brain chips, stem cell therapies could help those with Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, but also those with type 1 diabetes, heart disease, burns, cancer, arthritis, and all sorts of other diseases. Another biotechnology is gene editing. Using CRISPR slash Case9 technology, scientists can now remove strands of DNA that are causing illnesses and replace them with different ones. In the future, scientists hope to cure lifelong inherited diseases with this technology. While we decarbonize the world's economy, we will utilize carbon removal technology. Carbon capture and storage will catch carbon emissions from a source and then transport them underground, leaving the atmosphere unaffected. Advanced technologies will remove carbon directly from the air and seawater. Additionally, some minerals naturally react with carbon dioxide, and we can use them to convert carbon from gas into a solid. It's not sure which of these strategies is best, but in the future, we will certainly see their widespread implementation. If you enjoyed this video, it would be amazing if you like and subscribe. Also, remember to check out the comments and join the conversation. Thanks for watching, and see you next time. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I have concluded the presentation. Uh, participants can uh, enter in the chat box if any questions are there. And we'll have a discussion session now. So any, yeah, yeah. Uh... Uh, sir, I think there are no questions. Uh, I have one question, uh, Sharon. Uh, sir, please. Yeah, uh, sir, I'm uh, an excellent presentation. This is Samson, uh, NetPack director. Uh, you have touched upon uh, uh, like uh, various uh, areas, uh, <laughs> starting from yeah, the transportation, especially the high speed uh, rail, robotics, uh, A. Uh, aircraft technology, etc. Collection of a uh, lot of uh, decept deceptive technology. Very good uh, presentation. Uh, congratulations to you. Yeah. Uh, my yeah. question is. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Considering the uh, the social, economical, political, and uh, more importantly, the technological uh, uh, like background of uh, India, or especially to Kerala, can you? Uh, uh, like list out maybe three to five uh, important areas where we can uh, concentrate uh, in the next three to five years, especially the transportation and the communication uh, area. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Kerala, uh, I am not an expert, but what I feel is this. Kerala is a very highly uh, densely populated uh, uh, place. And our problem is the environmental pollution is going to increase drastically. So first, well, the priority should be to have a clean, clean environment, clean, clean city. That is the first uh, priority out of all this. Definitely, all these um, technologies will come to Kerala also, maybe uh, another instead of 50, maybe 70, 80 years. It will take some more time than the advanced countries. But the uh, uh, if I look back, when I was studying, that is about 40 years back, when I was in the colleges, the telephone, telephone was such a rare thing. Even in 90s, when I wanted to get a telephone, I had to pay the price of uh, one cent of land for buying one telephone at that time. 
but now i have two telephones in my two pockets so what i wanted to convey was over a period of 20 25 years all the technologies with regard to telephone phone in all other countries have come to kerala so uh, you can expect all these technologies what are happening elsewhere it will come to kerala as well as to india sooner not very long you need not have very wait very long for such technologies uh, i don't know which one to say give higher priority communication definitely it's very important transportation is important then after, after i mean above all this i thought the uh, environmental cleanliness pollution etc should be given much more trust than uh, these extra, these additional things okay thank you sir sir there is a question in the chat box uh, it says what is the present status of carbon capture technology I don't know. I am not in that uh, technology area, so I am not um, uh, aware of that. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. And, sir, there is another question also. Uh, is all the AI systems developed mature enough to grow and control into controlling humans? Yeah, this is uh, always a fear, whether the artificial intelligence will take over and uh, whether they will the robots whether they will rule humans this is a question uh, now really there is a th there is a thought some people are divided uh, musk Elon musk and uh, those uh, category of people say it may happen because the um, uh, people's more people's intelligence is going to concentrate maybe in one one robot that is possible so uh, we don't know um, whether that will happen or not okay thank you sir uh, another no, question is okay uh, the question is regarding the preparation we need to do to address the different challenges we will come across when opening gates for new technologies especially regarding security concerns that these technologies might arise yeah always is, this is it, it is there is a security concern the cyber security um, and not only security the privacy now uh, the privacy is everybody talk about privacy but um, if i put my mobile phone in my pocket and walk around random to different places and the next day uh, google will tell me uh, where all you have gone i was not aware that uh, such a thing is happening but it is there so it it is a problem um, so cyber security and that similar security that 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 itself is a technology by itself security providing security in all these um, technological advancement that itself is a uh, another technology lot of people are working in that area also yes the answer is yes it is a threat and people are working on that also uh, thank you sir uh, another answer. question from ajay krishna is uh, do countries like india moving well in this regard yeah india uh, is moving well i feel india is moving well uh, and uh, technology wise China and then India. Uh, India is having the, in the world, India is the third biggest technology manpower resource country. Uh, all other countries do not have this much technological capable manpower. So we are in, we are really in ahead. Our problem is only uh, a little bit money and giving a very strong leadership. These are the true problems. Once tackled, uh, this is not an issue. We also uh, will come, may even go ahead of China at some point in time. This is uh, why I am telling this is 
if it, it is only a matter of 20 years during 90s from 95 to this to uh, 2020 and the, the tremendous progress that india has made in many technologically technology is it, it, it will surpass that have taken place in many other countries. So uh, India is the IT capital of the world. Information technology uh, capital is India. Other countries are all behind us in the case of IT manpower, IT technology. So uh, we can expect India will come to very highly advanced a technology nation in the near future. Yes. For example, you look at the space, space activities. In the world, there are only five or six countries where space activities are there. US, Russia, France, Japan, and China. There are no other countries, so even Australia or even Britain or Italy or Spain. They are all economically advanced country, even Canada. They are all far, far behind India in, in, the, in the area of space sector. Similarly is the case with the atomic energy also. So um, it's only a matter of a little bit of money and then a very te good technological leadership. That is the only thing that is required. So by uh, the same year 2050, we also will be on par with the other world countries. That is the answer I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. If there are no more questions, we can wind up the session. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we'll wind up the now, session. One more thing I just wanted to tell you. Sir, please. Before winding up, I would like to tell one point. During the presentation, I don't know whether you have noticed, all the PowerPoint, uh, what I have presented, the voice was rendered by an artificial intelligence software. It is not my voice. It was rendered from a text to speech. AI software has an, ended that. I have written the text and a person was talking, that reading that. The software was actually talking, not a person. So what I want to tell is the even the AI uh, technology has come to our country and you are seeing AI in all the areas, even even the Google Assistant, what I told, no, that is also artificial intelligence. I think that's okay. Thank you. I wanted to conclude. Thank you very, very much. Very interesting, sir. Thank you, sir. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Then. Now it is my duty to propose the vote of thanks. Uh, to the speaker and the participants here uh, who have attended the session and I do consider it as a privilege and as we all know we have had a very wonderful talk from a top technologist from a very reputed industry from Kerala and uh, as introduced uh, in the beginning Ignatius sir also has a very long uh, experience at uh, the ISRO that is the ISRO and uh, thank you, sir, for being with us and uh, sharing your uh, wonderful talk. And it was uh, at the same time very entertaining and very informative. And uh, many participants have chatted to me privately that this talk was very in informative and entertaining. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the uh, efforts and the preparations that you have put towards uh, uh, that you put towards this talk to be uh, very useful for the participants. Thank you, sir. And thank you very point, much. Thank, thank you. you, sir. And at this point of time, I would like to say that Winwish Technologies Private Limited is a very close ally of KCST, and they have support extended support to KCST in many of our schemes and programs. And we consider Winwish Technologies as a very socially committed uh, enterprise who really wishes to bring out the best from the uh, uh, the best innovative spirit and the best research uh, output from the students of Kerala. And uh, uh, thank you, Winwish Technologies. And my contact at Winwish Technologies was uh, Pius Vagi, sir. 
and when i talk to pais vaghi sir about this webinar series and that uh, we would like to have a talk from winwish technologies he didn't have a second thought and he readily agreed uh, to our request and he had uh, given us a very good speaker also thank you sir and uh, apart from this i've had earlier interactions with pais sir also and i have never heard him say no for anything that is beneficial for the students uh, of kerala so thank you sir and we hope that our relationship with winwish continues uh, in the future also i would also like to thank the directors of r&d centers my senior scientists at kcst my colleagues at kcst for uh, for being with us today and also for extending all the support that is needed to organize the program thank you all and i thank all the participants uh for who have attended the session i hope that you all got benefited uh by the session to a very great extent thank you all and i hope that you'll be with us in the coming sessions also thank you participants so thank you all and the next okay, webinar thank you thank you uh, the next webinar tomorrow we will not be having a webinar because tomorrow is a public holiday and day after tomorrow uh, we'll have a webinar from we'll have a talk from professor sujada srinivasan from iit madras now professor sujada uh, is a person who designed india's first standing wheelchair and she and her team at uh, iit madras works hard towards developing technologies uh, uh, for the disabled so that they also get included in the society so uh, i think that it is a very relevant topic and a very important topic because uh, important area because um, we 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 found that technology has advanced in many fields so it is very important that we extend this technological advancements to the disabled people also so that they will also get included in the society like others so i hope that uh, all of you will join us on uh, 14th at 4 pm the topic would be technology for in inclusion functional and affordable assistive devices the link will be shared with all registered participants to their in their registered email id and we'll also be sharing the feedback form to your uh, email so uh, i hope to get a good response from you and meet you all to uh, all day after tomorrow at 4 pm thank you all wish you a good day thank you all